I have supervised between 20 and 30 bachelor's and master's thesis in the eight years I've been here as a PhD student and as a postdoc. And I've seen some very successful theses but I've also seen the same mistakes being repeated over and over again, both in the thesis I supervised and in the thesis my colleagues supervised. And in this talk, I want to give the best practices and the lessons learned from those theses I've experienced in those eight years. Now, I have a dilemma. The longer I supervise theses, the longer ago my own thesis is in my mind. So the harder it gets for me to remember how it felt like to write my own diploma thesis. So, to allow you to get the most out of this presentation, please ask questions uh, about the points you're interested in. And not only questions, if you have opinions, for example, I think that's crap, I've heard something else, please say that as well. It needs not be a well-phrased question. If you have doubts or different opinions, or heard some rumor that it should be in a different way, please tell me, then we can discuss that and you can take out more from that uh, presentation. I've said that I'm gonna present my experiences, so, some background on me. I studied computer science or informatic here at Technical University of Munich. I started in 2000 and I handed in my diploma thesis in 2006. And then I did my PhD here at Lehrstuhl Breu. So you can see that you don't starve as a computer scientist here <laughs> working in, in Munich. And in 2009 I co-founded a company where I spend some of my time now. I spend some of my time as a postdoc at Lehrstuhl Breu. So why do I have these pictures here? I know all the three relevant perspectives from my own experience. The writing perspective as a student, from my own time studying here, and from writing my diploma thesis and my PhD thesis. The internal supervisor perspective, from my time as a PhD student where I worked at the uh, Lehrstuhl. And also the perspective as an industry worker who supervises from inside a company where the demands and the resources are slightly different. I'm gonna structure the presentation like this. I'm gonna start with why you should do a thesis. Because, I mean, you have to. You can't get your degree without doing a thesis, but I think that's a bad reason. I think that's not very motivating, so I'm gonna give some more reasons why you should do it. And then I'm gonna continue with what is important about the thesis. Like, what do you need to do? What do you need to include in the thesis so that you get a good, get a good mark? or that you experience and grow interesting things during the thesis. Next thing is how to choose a topic. How do you find a topic? How do you find open topics? How do you choose a supervisor? And what should you uh, keep in mind when choosing a supervisor? Then doing the actual work. And finally, presenting the work you did. As Angelica said, I have a website as companion to that presentation. It's called thesisguide.org. And it con will contain the video from this presentation. It contains the German video from the bachelor presentation, which is mostly similar. And it contains uh, the, the slides. I'm going to put them up there. And it has detailed posts that go into some depth for some of the topics which I can't put in this presentation due to time reasons. So let me start. I think most of you have done a bachelor's thesis before. But other than that, from my experience, there's very little room for creativity during the typical work assignments you do during your career as a student. For me, studying in many areas feels a lot like assembling an IKEA cupboard. I guess everybody of you is familiar with assembling IKEA cupboards. Why do I choose this metaphor? If you assemble such a cupboard, there is many ways you can do that wrong, but there's just one way to do it right. And the end result is very much expected beforehand. And it's the same thing when you write a, um, a clausure, if you take an exam here in the studies. There goes much effort into making sure that there's only one valid result for an for a exam. Why is that? We once made the mistake of having um, a test in the exam for which 40 correct answers were uh, correct, and that makes it very hard to correct that test, that exam. We had 1,000 students taking that exam, so we had, had to correct 2,000 versions, because every exam has to be corrected twice. And if you, for 2,000 times, have to check between 40 different correct uh, solutions, it's very hard. So my colleague who made that test was not very popular in the several months it took us 
to correct that exam. So the group enforced some process to make sure that there's only one correct solution. And so there's very little room for creativity. In your thesis, it's different. In your thesis, you get your own problem to work on, and you get individual feedback from your supervisor. And this allows you to learn much more and to grow much more during the experience. So a thesis is not like this. But to make that more specific, I want to give one thesis which I supervised, which I like a lot as a running example for that presentation. But let me start with a question. Who of you has ever worked on an open source project? Like fixed a bug or reported a bug or programmed some code? You have done that. You have done that, maybe some more. Then you probably know that the first thing you do is you download the code, and often it's very much. And then you don't really know where to start reading. So this is, this is some of the files, like 5% of the files of the open source project that our group works on. It's called Concat. It's a program analysis tool. And the question is, where do you start reading when you want to work on that, on that program? And the simple answer is, if you know somebody from the team, you can ask them what are the most important concepts in that code, which are the classes or the interfaces I should read first, because everything else builds up on top of them. And if you know somebody from that group, you can ask him. This is, for Concord, this is the 10 most important classes and interfaces from my perspective. But if the team changes, or if you don't know anybody from the team, you can't ask. So the question we wanted to answer, the, the basic idea we had for the thesis was, can't we automate that? Because if I know the code, I suggest the most central classes, everything else references to. So the basic idea was, let's create a dependency graph of the system, and then use some algorithm to see what are the most gentle ones. For example, now I have a color, I've used the dimension of color to indicate the most central classes here. So this was the basic idea. Now, there's different ways of computing centrality in a graph. For example, Wikipedia lists six. There's PageRank, for example, which you may, may know from Google, and there's several other ones uh, which are useful for certain areas. Now, we didn't know which one would be the best. So the idea of the thesis was to ask developers from different systems for their opinion, and then implement the different cent centrality algorithms, and then see which works best. And Daniela worked on their thesis. She asked from developers from five different systems, compared the different algorithms, and we found a solution that even worked better than the answers from, a, from an individual developer. So this is a thesis that worked out well, and Daniela published the results in a paper and presented the work on an international software engineering research conference. And this is a pattern I've experienced several times. Martin, for example, has presented his work in another international conference. We've had a couple of more students in recent years. Moritz presented in a conference in Germany and now in a conference in India. And I have two students currently working on their papers that present their work. But this is kind of the, the best case. It's not necessary for a successful master thesis to present on an international conference. There's many different kinds of things you can learn during a master thesis. And other is you might get to know a company, you might get to know some programming language better or experience, gather experience in some, some framework where you implement it. I have some different examples. I supervise a thesis where we implemented a plugin to show code analysis results inside the IDE. We implemented uh, and analyzed different software architectures in a bachelor thesis. And we implemented a, a trace viewer where you can load trace diagrams and then step in and step out of different interactions. There's also a thesis where you don't need to implement anything. This is the thesis from Moritz. He analyzed review findings. We've done reviews for eight years on our code and found thousands of problems. And he analyzed the data from the eight years and to classify what kind of problems do we actually find. So this was a thesis without implementation which was further on analysis, and he published the results as well. So there's very different ways in which you uh, can, can create your thesis. So what makes it important? The metaphor I like to use to, to, to explain what makes a thesis good, what are the factors that decide whether a thesis is good, is beer. For several reasons. First, I like to drink beer myself, and second, I think that it fits 
the point I want to make quite well. All those beers are from different countries, and from afar they look very similar. But if you taste them, they're quite different. There's the German beers you might know, like Helles or Weissbier. Weissbier is a lot more foamy and tastes different than Helles, but they're still quite similar compared to dark beer or some stuff from Belgium where there might even be cherry juice in there. So what is the best beer, or what makes a beer good? From my experience, it depends on the expectations of the person who drinks that beer. And that mostly depends on the beers he grew up with. I like Helles best, Augustina, because I grew up with Augustina. My friends from the northern part of Germany like Pils best, because they grew up with Pils. Now, what does that have to do with thesis? From my experience, your supervisor expects those things in your thesis that he kind of grew up with, with a thesis he supervised or he wrote himself. So if somebody works in a more formal area, he will expect proofs in a good thesis. If, if you work in a more um, applied area, you will expect empirical studies of different types. So depending on both the background of your supervisor and the topic of the thesis, different elements make up a good thesis. So in my own thesis, I implemented several clone detection algorithms, and the different algorithms produce exactly the same result. So it's interesting to see which are faster than the others. So I did a couple of measurements. So I had to include those measurements. I just supervised another thesis where the re resulting program suggests refactorings, how to split up a method in different ways. And so we don't know which one is best, and we don't know if it works, so we had to ask developers. So the thesis includes a survey where many developer, developers participated and then voted whether they liked the results or not. So my advice is, if you ch chose a supervisor to find out what he expects from a good thesis, read other theses from that group. Get some theses he supervised before. If it's a new supervisor and hasn't supervised theses before, get some of his colleagues. Look how long they are, what kinds of elements they include, how they are structured, and then you will see some, some patterns uh, arising, how they're typically created. So it's not so, hard, so easy to say what factors make up a good thesis, but what is really trans transferable are the rules involved in, in writing a thesis. Every thesis has an author, a supervisor, and a professor. And there's also very clear roles of those three. So the author creates the solution, implements the code, or analyzes literature, writes the text, and presents the work. The supervisor invents the topic. It's typically not the professor, but the supervisor. Gives you feedback for your work during the supervision. Evaluates your thesis and creates the mark. And the professor, in most cases, only does, uh, gives feedback on the topic, not feedback directly on your work, and performs the formal evaluation. By formal evaluation, I mean the supervisor typically writes down two or three pages with a suggested mark, and then the professor officially, officially gives that mark. And in most cases, the marks are very similar. So which role is more important for you? Obviously, the supervisor, because the supervisor spends a lot more time with you than the professor. In some cases, the professor and the supervisor are the same person. Some professors supervise master theses themselves, but because there are much more PhD students than professors here at the university, it's much more likely that you get a PhD student as a supervisor. Any questions so far on what makes a good thesis or the roles? Yeah? I repeat the question, what percentage of students publish their papers? Honestly, I don't know. I think from my uh, students, maybe a third. But it, it depends a lot on the kind of work you do. And I think what I can say is if you want to publish, if your goal is to publish the result of the thesis, then you should communicate that early on, because some topics are much easier to publish than others. If the topic is mostly about implementation, it's a lot more difficult to publish than something which, is, um, which has already a publication and a venue in mind. Further questions? Yeah? Uh, where to find uh, past uh, master thesis? Where to find past master thesis? 
often on the pages of the supervisors, and if not, just ask them. Is there a central repository? There is a central repository of open topics. I'm not aware of a central repository of finished thesis. But I wouldn't start looking for finished thesis. I would first choose the supervisor and then read existing thesis in that area, because otherwise you might learn a lot of stuff which is not applicable to your thesis. You might find some thesis in the library, but it's not uh, mandatory to give a thesis, a copy of a thesis to the library and usually students do not do it. So if you find a supervisor or you find a professor, then you ask them directly, can you give me some of your past thesis? I have all of the thesis my students did in PDF. So, and, and I guess most other supervisors do that too. So just write them an email and ask them for uh, previous thesis. Further questions? Then I'm going to continue with choosing a topic. When you choose a topic, it's obvious that you also choose the supervisor. What's not so obvious is that you also choose how much time the supervisor has for your supervision. And I want to spend some minutes on, on that point, because I got that entirely wrong when I was a student. When I did my diploma thesis, my impression was I'm handing in kind of six months of full unpaid work, and I expect my supervisor to invest a lot of time for supervision because I felt that the supervisor gets paid for doing that supervision. And that's wrong and unhelpful. It's wrong because many of the PhD students are not paid for doing, um, for supervising thesis. Often they work on research projects which are independent of uh, teaching assignments. So it's not really their job officially. And it's unhelpful because it doesn't give you any handle to improve the situation. I want to give you some of my own experiences from, from writing my PhD thesis. In my third year, I was frustrated that I didn't progress as quickly as I wanted. And I felt that although I tried to put much time into my research and my thesis, I didn't really succeed. To, so to see where my time went, I clocked myself. I installed an app on my phone, and then everything I did for several weeks, I clocked my entire day. And after like a week, I analyze the data, and all the gray stuff is time I spent on things I had to do but, but didn't have anything to do with my PhD thesis, and the red stuff is the time that actually went into my thesis. And the blue line is the number of hours that according to my contract I had to work. So the frustrating realization after one week was I didn't even manage to put my overtime into my thesis. And that's very, sim very common for PhD students. So I did change some things then, and I delegated some work, and I kind of did not work so much in some of the areas I had to work. But this was the result. So although the red areas increased, so I managed to, to spend more time with the thesis, still more than half my time went into other tasks. So why am I telling you this? If you have a topic which is not in the central interest of your supervisor, you, compare, you compete with his spare time or his research time for supervision time. So what you don't want to is that the interests of your supervisor and your own interests don't overlap. Because then you, don't, you won't really get supervision independent of how much he wants to supervise you. So what you really want to do is be either in this area, like a topic that he needs to do anyway for some project, then he has time which he can invest in the supervision, or a topic which is interested, interesting for his PhD thesis. And I, I stress that at the beginning, because what I often see is that a student has his own idea of a topic. I had myself uh, when, I, when I did my diploma thesis, and then writes emails to potential supervisors, and some of them or to professors. And the anti-pattern is you write to a professor, that professor dispatches the mail to some PhD student. That PhD student thinks he is obliged to supervise the thesis, although he doesn't want to, and then supervises you without really wanting to and without giving good supervision. So what works better is to uh, arrange the topic with the supervisor together or let the supervisor suggest the topic because as a supervisor, 
I have much more experience in what makes a good topic and what is, what is unsuitable for, the, for a thesis. In the end, my supervisor talked me into not doing the topic I had in mind, but using a topic he had in mind, and looking back, that was a good decision. So where do you find topics? There is a list of open topics on the faculty pages. It looks like this, and the link is here. But to be honest, that's not the best source of topics for your thesis. For several reasons. Mostly they are outdated, and very many supervisors don't announce their topics. I've stopped doing so as well, because it's simply, there's no return on invest. You spend half a day writing a topic, and then nobody ever writes you an email or calls you. Or if you get an email, it's very poorly done. I've received like four emails uh, answering to my topics in eight years, and three of them were like five writing errors in two sentences. So, and that doesn't really make you wanting to supervise that, that, uh, that project. So what works much better is uh, to think which lectures did you like, which übungen or like lab courses did you like, and which persons that work in teaching in those areas do you like and want to work together with them. And then ask them if they have topics. And often they do, and especially if they know you or if, if they see that you're interested, they will supervise you. So, or ask friends or older students who have already done their thesis for good supervisors. What experiences they made and who they can recommend. Last thing here, if you apply for a thesis, it's, it's an application. So don't, don't just write two lines that are written, riddled with errors, but make clear why you're interested in the topic and why the supervisor should be interested in you. And optionally, you can add some motivation for the topic and attach a CV with some experience you have in that area. And there is a service from the TU. There's the Career Service Center that can give feedback on your CV. But personally, I don't think the CV is so important. It's important that you clearly express why you're interested in the topic and if you have some experience in that area. Maybe the framework, maybe a programming language. If you have programming experience at all, or something else that makes you unique or different from the masses that might study with you. So, I've covered your own interest, the supervisor interest, and there's a third area which I want to cover, which is the location, location factors. Because for an ideal work environment, you are in, in the intersection of all three. And there's basically two different environments you can do your thesis in. The first one is an internal thesis at the, at the university, and it's not better or worse to do it in one or the other environment. Both, has, both environments have advantages, but it's important that the, the properties of the environment much match the requirements of the thesis. And the advantages of doing an internal thesis are that, that you get a closer contact to a research group. It's also easier to find a supervisor. So if you're thinking of doing a PhD, I would suggest that you do an internal thesis, because you, you, then it's much easier to get to know a professor and maybe then apply in his group later on. It's also more easy to do a scientific publication afterwards, because a research group is typically much more experienced in writing a paper than a company is. And you can work on more visionary topics, topics that are not clear whether they will result in a positive result. Sometimes. Sometimes you have a, a good research idea, and it tur turns out it doesn't work at all. And from a scientific perspective, that's a good result, because somebody else doesn't need to try the same idea. From a company perspective, not so much, because their problem is still unsolved. So for these types of work, it's better to, uh, to search for an internal area. And typically, universities have more experience in, in supervision. On the other hand, if you do it in a company, you often get a foot into the door, and many of the students are supervised to did their thesis in companies after their studies stayed in that company. So if you want to get, build up a network or contacts there, do the, the thesis in a company. It's also easier to find a, co a topic that's relevant uh, in practice, and you might get paid. The official rules are that because it's an exam, you are not allowed to get paid. But there's a kind of a workaround that you don't directly get paid, but they buy the rights and they 
buy them in six uh, pieces and they align with the months. So it feels like getting paid and it's uh, not illegal, but typically as a supervisor I don't want to know about that. Because officially it's not allowed, on the other hand Munich is very expensive and I'm well aware that many people need to work to uh, buy their living. So there is workarounds and it's much more likely that you get paid in industry than, than in university. Publications are more difficult. And the most important point here, if you do it in a company, you typically have one supervisor in the company and one supervisor in university. And you need to synchronize them. If they have different expectations of your work, and especially if you find out very late when you want to hand in your thesis, typically this means trouble and it means trouble for you, and it means trouble at a late point where it's hard to fix that. So if you do an external thesis, get the two supervisors on the same table very early so that they uh, communicate the expectations and then agree on what is realistic. There's one special case. There's some companies which are very close to university. I said before, I co-founded a, a company. We are called CQSE. We are at 500 meters walking here next to the campus Kneipe. We are 16 now and 12 students, so we are more or less 30, and we also offer uh, master thesis topics. And because 11 of the 16 in our companies have a PhD, we have a lot of experience and, and research in doing those, those theses. Last point here, even if the topic is interested, interesting and your supervisor is interested and location is good, it might still be a very bad topic. How can you, I have a short checklist to see if a topic is good or if it sucks. So, for me, a topic is unsuitable if you can't tell if a solution for the problem is good or not. And you can tell by, is there a very crisp problem statement? And is there a well, way to evaluate alternative solutions? And why is that important? because it helps you be choose between solution alternatives. This is probably the most obvious thing. It helps you convince your supervisor, and what is subtle but important, it helps your supervisor to convince his professor why he can give you a good mark. And if, the, if, you, if you need an opinion to say why the solution is good or not, this is much harder than if, if there's some obvious objective evidence why it's a good solution. And let me detail that with, a, with two thesis I supervised myself. The first one, I, the running example I had from the thesis from Daniela, there we, she developed the algorithm and it says some classes are more important or more central than others. And just by that, I don't know if it's a good solution. Some other algorithm might suggest some other classes and I don't know which ones are better. So what she did and what we had designed into the topic when we created the thesis was to create a benchmark by asking those developers from the different open source system to create a gold standard against which we can run the tool. So here we could then say this algorithm is even better than the individual developers and so it was easy to give a good mark and it was easy to, relatively easy to publish as a paper. As a counterexample, how not to do it, the very first thesis I ever supervised the topic was Unterstützung von Sprachentwicklung durch Visualisierung, which in English is supporting language development through visualization, which is not a very crisp topic. And the idea was to visualize context-free grammars so that it would help people building compilers or some other language development tools. And that was it. There was no way of evaluating whether a visualization was good or not, or useful or not. And this made it much harder for the student to work and made it also harder for, the, uh, for me as a supervisor to supervise their thesis. I've seen some anti-patterns, and I just want to point out three ones. The first one is search my literature. All those three anti-patterns are from supervisors who want, have to do work and don't want to do it and want to delegate it to students. So the first one is when you write a PhD thesis, you need to do related work chapter and the goal of their thesis is to have somebody else write that related work chapter. And it's hard for you as a student because you don't know when you have enough literature, you can't really express why you did a good job at searching that and so on. 
Second one is implementation only. And third one is choose my tool. I often see choose my tool in industrial contexts when a company has to buy some tool for X and there's maybe three or four different ones and then a student has to choose which one. And that's very frustrating because typically, the tool, uh, independent of what you find out, the decision which tool gets bought is done on a different basis. Maybe the boss has lunch with some vendor and then he buys that tool. So it's not only a bad topic, but it's also frustrating if you work on that. All those three have lack evaluation criteria and don't really guide your own work and make publication difficult. Last slide on finding the topic is on when to register. You can register every 15th of a month and have six months until you have to hand in. And the handing in deadline is hard. So there's some discussion of whether you should start your work before you register the thesis. Because then in theory, you can get more time easily. You could work two or three months on the thesis and then register and then you have another six months. And I don't uh, advise you to do that. My advice and also Angelica and Vivia's advice is to register early. Maybe spend two or three weeks to get to know the topic and the supervisor so that you don't get any bad surprises, but then register. Otherwise, it simply takes twice as long. When I did my diploma arbeit, some of my friends did not register, and most of them took an entire year. They took twice as long as the ones who registered immediately. And the main reason is that the scope explodes. If you have more time, and especially if you're doing a good job, your supervisor is kind of tempted to put more in. And if there's a hard deadline, that, that temptation is uh, not so much. So it's kind of a, the, the deadline is a protection, both uh, for you and your supervisor, and our advice is to register early. Questions on that part, on how to find a topic? Yeah? What happens if uh, things take longer than expected? Communicate it to your supervisor. Every interesting topic works out differently than I expected. If I, as a supervisor, know exactly how it will work, it's an uninteresting topic. So every one of the 20 or 30 theses I supervised, at some point, took much longer than we expected. And typically, we reduced the scope then. Maybe we thought we would analyze 10 systems, and then we decide we only do two, five. Or we wanted to analyze three programming languages, then we only do two. And so this is kind of the content side why it can do longer. If there's other reasons, for example, if you get ill for a month, then you can get an extension of your time period. But not on the last day, not so easy on the last day of the period. So whenever there's any problem, communicate it early. That makes it much, much easier to fix that. Other questions or opinions? Yeah. How can you find a supervisor in a company? Yeah, good question. I think it's right now pretty easy, easy to find a company that offers master thesis opportunities. But it's, uh, as you said, it's hard to find a university supervisor that, it, that is interested in that topic. And my point of view is that it's the company's responsibility to have a connection to the TU. To TU. It should not be your job to uh, go with a topic from the company and find somebody at TU. So if you see postings for master thesis and companies, ask very early if they have a contact to TU. Many companies have, and then they can use their existing relationships. And the second thing is very early get both supervisors together, and often, often the, the, the PhD student can find something interesting, interesting in that area. Very often the main motivation of a company is not so much the specific problem, but to get to know you as a student. So often the companies are flexible with the topic, as long as they get a student uh, who is motivated and then works on the topic, so that they can get to know that student. And so that you can, the, it works, Typically, well to arrange a topic which is interesting for the company and for the PhD student. And there are some postings outside, I think, and in the different groups also for external thesis. <laughs>
and we, for some advertisement, we also offer one. And since I'm both roles, it's easier in, in our case. Yeah? You mean uh, if there's a thesis topic which is about implementation? Yeah. If a company wants something implemented, yeah. then it's probably not a, not a good topic for a thesis. I would also say this. Is, are you sure that this is really a good topic for a thesis? As far as you told us, I don't think so. Because as a supervisor, I don't know how to grade that. And there's no scientific interest in just having something implemented. So sometimes you can construct a topic from that. If there's some research question you can put into that context. But just having something implemented is not a thesis topic. Further, yeah. You mentioned a few times that PhD students have taught more to do than their topics and uh, time to supervise. Would you suggest that we move forward into optional thesis supervisors so that ah. less time? Do PhD students have more or less time than postdocs? I don't think there's a real difference. Postdocs also have a lot on their, on their plate. Typically, they're not working on their dissert dissertation, but on their habilitation. So different names, same amount of work. But uh, just talk to different ones. Not everybody. Also, it changes over time. You're not uh, equally overworked in every single year or month of your, of your work. What about doing a master thesis in a different university? It's possible, also in a different country, but it takes a lot more time to, to organize and set up. And you also need a supervisor in that university and here, and it's best also to synchronize them early so that they have the same interests. So you always need a professor here at the Department of Informatics who officially registers the thesis and officially then in the end grades the thesis. And what happens in between? is to be negotiated. But you always need an official professor of our department to register and grade it. Mark, yeah? The author? It depends on the context. In an internal thesis, the author is involved, maybe you the PhD student, and his professor. In an external thesis, there's a fourth person, namely the supervisor from the company. The question is how, just I repeat it for the camera, how do professors dispatch queries to their PhD students? I don't know. I think it depends a lot on the professor. And I think there's no silver bullet, no one single way to uh, get supervisors or professors interested in your topic. I think you just have to try different ways. <laughs>
And I think what not works so well is if you just walk down the aisle and knock on the door and then go inside and ask the, the people if they have topics. One year ago when I did the, uh, the presentation, some of my colleagues told me that a group of five students had entered their office and asked to see their topics. Uh, it's probably better to write emails first and ask for a coffee or for some time to meet in person. Well, it's the same as uh, for a company or for um, uh, another university in, in Germany or outside of Germany. So you always need a professor here and usually need a supervisor here because the professors usually then <coughs> give you also a supervisor and then you have the supervisor of the other department. Yes, but you always need somebody here. There are very few professors who have a joint department at our department. They can also... Uh, officially be uh, the, how did you call them, not supervisor, but professor, examiner of the thesis. But most of the times it's just like you do it in a company because you do it in a different department. Same procedure holds. Will it work out if you spend half your time working on other stuff and half your time of your thesis? I think for a really good thesis, I advise my students to spend their entire time working on the thesis. You have to answer for yourself if you can do uh, the same amount of work in half the time as uh, somebody else. But I always suggest my students to spend all or at least most of the time on the thesis. And please be aware that in the end the examiner makes the grade, the professor. So if you fulfill all the criteria the uh, company is asking you to do, it doesn't mean that you will get a good grade. You have to fulfill as well the, the scientific criteria for the master's thesis. And if you are working 20 hours uh, per week just for the company, then it will, uh, you, it, there will be a lack of time for finishing your master's thesis according to the scientific rules. Most probably. And one, one uh, addition to that, I've seen some students who say, um, I can work two days a week at a company, and I still have five days left, so I have five days for my thesis. And this is not a good idea if you plan every single weekend. You need weekends to relax and as buffers. If you don't have buffers, this means problems in time management in the long run. I think it gets too specific. Let's do that afterwards. Let's take that offline. I'm going to continue with the next part. We have time for more questions later. Last question. Uh, do you recommend to do a guided research during your thesis? No, no. Uh, in the chair that I'm interested to my Yes, why not? Um, I often have the same student doing a bachelor thesis, then a guided research, and then a master thesis. So I recommend that. You can often even work in the same area then and kind of expand on the topic you did in the guided research and build your master thesis on top of that. But if your idea is just to get to know the chair better or the supervisors or the professors and so on, then it's also possible to take a lab course, for example, or a seminar or an advanced lecture as well. So it doesn't have to be necessarily the guided research. But of course, it is a good idea to step in into the research area. So we've spoken a lot about how to find a topic and find a supervisor. I want to now speak about what to do when you have the topic, how to do the actual work. And before that, I want to get two things out of the way. And the first is 
A master thesis is a scientific work. So what characterizes scientific work? And if you Google that, you will find that there's an entire research discipline on what research is. So I have a very short answer. And in German, scientific work is wissenschaftliches Arbeiten. And for me, Wissenschaft schafft Wissen. So research creates knowledge. And the core criterion for a scientific work is for me that it divides hypothesis, what you think is true, or your opinion, from the knowledge, what you know is true. And it also separates the work you built on from your own work. That's it. That's my short definition of uh, a scientific work. And the goal is to enable a reader to retrace what you did. What were your hypotheses? What came out? Maybe it's a positive, maybe it's a negative finding. But I want to clearly be able to tell apart your, your opinion and the results of your work. And also what, what you built on from other papers. And the second thing is, the second thing I want to get out of the way is the interface between you and the supervisor. Because that also is something where it's useful to have a common understanding, both you and your supervisor, about what your responsibilities are and what the supervisor responsibilities are. And the author responsibilities are time management, request for feedback. Feedback culture is different. Some supervisors will give you feedback on their own. Others will not until you ask them. So for me, it's your responsibility to ask them for feedback if you want any. And communicate problems. If it Anything takes longer, say it early. Then your supervisor can still help you. And make decisions. So very often during a thesis you're at a crossroads and need to decide if you go left or right. And it's your responsibility to make that choices because you have to live with the consequences. You can ask your supervisor for feedback, but if your supervisor tells you to go left and then it's a bad idea, it will still be your problem. Because it's your work and you get the mark. So uh, you have to make the, make the choices and the decisions in the, in the work. Um, what I like is if a student, but that's not obligatory, but some students at the beginning of every meeting give me a status where they are, what they did, and what they plan to do next. And that helps me to get, a, to get into context of their thesis, because all, as a student you spend your entire time with a thesis, but as a supervisor, maybe you work with several different students and several different projects at the same time. And it, then it helps to task switch to get some context from the student. The supervisor responsibilities are topic definition and clarification, scoping, and giving feedback. And I want to expand on scoping a bit. I said before that every interesting thesis has some unforeseeable elements. And for me, that means that together with the students, Frequently, I have to see, is it too much or too little work that's still on the plate? In most cases, things take longer than expected. Then we have to reduce some of the parameters. But in some cases, it also goes quicker than expected. I had one thesis where after two weeks, a student said he found a library on some Scandinavian university page that implements most of what we wanted to implement. So after two weeks, the topic was basically finished, and then we could design a much larger study which uh, enriched the thesis. So whenever you feel there's too much work for the available time, speak with the supervisor. That's not necessarily a bad sign. And in most cases, it's not your problem or your fault. But it will be if you don't communicate that and, uh, or if it, you communicate it at a late point. It's not the responsibility of the supervisor to micromanage you or to do your time management and to take away decisions or to proofread the complete work. So it's good to have somebody proofread the complete work, but as a supervisor, if I proofread too much and give too much too detailed feedback very many times, at some point it feels like reading my own work and then it's very hard to grade that. So give some text to your supervisor to get feedback on your writing style, but don't expect your supervisor to read the entire work. We have six months of work time for the master thesis. And what worked well for me is to meet on a weekly basis with my students at first. So the first two, three, four, five weeks, we meet for an hour every single week to make sure that we have the same understanding about the topic. Then 
after four, five, six weeks, typically the student has understood the topic and knows the work and the tools and can work on his own and only comes to me on demand. So then for a certain time, we meet infrequently, maybe every two weeks, maybe for, two, for one week twice because there's some uh, stuff that needs more, more discussion, but more infrequently. But then in the last two months, the writing down starts and we need to w meet frequently again so that I, I can give feedback on the document before too much text is, is produced because otherwise you have to throw too much text away. And then again, there's some infrequent meetings here. And the only hard mi milestone I have is two months before handing in, I want to see an outline. Because the thesis outline is the form of the thesis where I can give feedback without destroying too much content. If I get a document with 50 pages uh, for my first read and think there's fundamental structural problems, then you will find out the text is hard to refactor and that you need to throw away a lot. And giving feedback on the outline uh, is the much better level of, of, of abstraction for that. Typically, you will find that most theses have the same structure. They have an introduction that says what is the problem. For the running example that was given all the classes in the project, which ones should I read first? Then fundamentals. This is the stuff you build up upon, but which is not really research related. For example, in the graph, centrality, thesis, what is a graph? Do you reference some textbook that defines what a graph is so that, so that you don't need to spend a lot of time on that? But in case a reader doesn't know that, he can look it up there. Third part, related work, is other research that works on the same problem. So in the centrality case, it could be other work on graph centrality or other papers that try to suggest classes for re reading first. Then solution approach is what we did and evaluation is the study we did together with the developers to see how it worked out. Future work is officially all the new topics or the new questions your work opens up. In practice, it's all the stuff you wanted to do but didn't get time for. So whenever you've come up with new ideas but don't have the time, take them down and put them in the future work section. And the conclusion wraps it up uh, for the readers who only read the introduction and then the conclusion so that they can get the condensed form of your thesis at once. Now, when you take down your thesis and make the outline and discuss it with the supervisor, and he says it's fine, you need to write down your thesis. And what you need to decide is how you allocate your time to those different chapters. And I, what I see is that there's a very intuitive algorithm for doing that, which is always wrong. And it's the same one uh, which I used to use when I filled my plate at a buffet. What do I mean? If I go to an all-you-can-eat buffet, I have a big white plate with a lot of white space I need to fill, just like the white pages in my thesis. And there's a lot of tasty stuff at the beginning of the buffet, and I pile on my table. And then I w walk on, and I see the curries and the more rich dishes, and I put them on my plate as well. And now my plate is pretty full, and I get to the really interesting stuff, the prawns and the mussels and so on. And obviously I want those, and I put them on on top as well, and the end result is some mix, which is not attractive, and where you easily see that not much thought went it, into its composition. What does that have to do with the thesis? I see many students who write it from introduction over fundamentals through related work in the same sequence as the chapters are uh, in, the in the outline. And the problem is that at first, when you have all that white space to fill, you write a lot of text for the introduction, you write a lot of fundamentals, maybe two pages about what a graph is. Because you learned that in some lecture and you still remember that and take that all down. And then, as with a plate, when you come to the more interesting and more relevant chapters, you run out of time. And then you have to compromise and don't get to the most important parts of your thesis. And really a thesis should spend two thirds, as a rule of thumb, on, those, on the solution approach and the evaluation. And what, what works well for me, both on a buffet and for a paper, is to make a top-down approach, to decide maybe I want to write n pages, let's say 40. If I want to spend 10 here and 10 here, maybe I only have two pages left for the introduction. 
And then if I write the introduction, it's fine if it only has two pages. For the buffet, it works well for me to make a, a conscious choice what I don't want to eat. And here it works well for me to make a conscious choice what I don't want to include or what I want to only cite or make very, very short. And it also works well for me to don't, not write them in order, but write them in the order of importance. So if solution approach and evaluation are most important, write those first. And write uh, the future work, which is the least important one, uh, as the last chapter. So if you ran out of time, you end up with a very short future work chapter, and not with a very short evaluation chapter, which would impact your grade much more. I have a more detailed post on the thesis guide, on the thesis architecture, and also on, on, on page allocation. Just some words on tools. I think that um, with the wrong choice of tools, you can create a lot of work for you, but even the right tools don't really help you much. It's much more your discipline and your approach that impacts your work than the tools. But still, I would suggest LaTeX over Word or other text systems. And the, the key here is to not create your own template, but get some template from somebody else who already did his master thesis and just delete all the content. Yeah? It's not supported anymore. Ah, oh, there's a GitHub version? Perfect. Can you send me the link? Then I can include that in the slides. Great, thanks. Otherwise, I, have, uh, I also have one which I can send, email you, or I could put that on the page. If anybody wants an, a pretty old one from me, just drop me an email, and I'm going to send you the template. I don't, I'm, I know hardly anything about LaTeX though. I wrote my thesis, I wrote my PhD thesis and all my papers in LaTeX, but the trick is to not have to invent the formatting yourself, but to find a, a document that already has all the relevant parts. Uh, you need a version control system. My wife is an industrial designer and if she loses her, her work because the computer crashes, that's bad, but it might be justifiable. But for computer scientists, it's not acceptable if a computer scientist loses his work due to uh, a disk problem. So use version control on a backup server. Your supervisor can probably uh, organize something. And use some management tool for, for literature references. Last thing on how to work. This is the table I, in, a, in the library I did most of my work on. It's in the Zivil- and Medienrechtsbibliothek at the LMU. Why did I go to the law library at LMU? Because there's not a single book I'm interested in. So there's no distractions. So what worked well for me was to go into a surrounding where I could do nothing but work on my thesis. And most times I also switched off my internet, because otherwise I would end up on Spiegel Online or something and not work on my thesis either. So it helped me to establish a writing routine to always work at the same time at the same table. And sometimes after two or three weeks, I was fed up with, the, with that library and I would switch to a different library. And there's libraries here, there's libraries in most of the student residences, and there's official libraries like Staatsbibliothek and so on. So there, there's a lot of choice. Questions on that? Is there a problem if you use a public repository? I think not in principle. If you do your work with a company, maybe you need to sign some non-disclosure agreement. But otherwise, it's your work. Maybe speak with your supervisor, but I don't see a problem in principle. No, because it's your work. You own your work, and wherever you put it, it's your decision. I think in principle you do. Sometimes if you do it at a company, you sign something where you basically sell them the rights, but you have the copyright. Sometimes also in the university you sell it. 
or they make you sell it. Yeah. And I think there's, you need to differentiate between uh, the text you write and the code. If you integrate the code into an existing code base, m in most cases, kind of, for example, our tool is Apache, open source license, and then we discussed with all the students at the very beginning that we want them to contribute the code they produce to that open source thing as well, because otherwise we can't use anything with the code. But typically you need to arrange that up front. And then the code typically ends up in the repository where the rest of the code is anyway. Good point. How much time should you spend on writing the thesis? For me, there's two different types of texts you write. You write notes and prose. And notes you should take during the entire time. When you read a paper, if there's anything interested, interesting in it, take down a note about that. Because although at the moment you read it, you feel you won't forget that, I always did. Especially if you read many papers, it kind of blurs months later which stuff was in which paper. So it worked well for me to take handwritten notes on the papers. Also, if I made some implementation choice, make a note why you did that so that you can remember that. I wouldn't suggest to write prose, though. Prose for me is the text of the final document. I would only start to write prose once you have the, the core results of your thesis. So once you have done the study or implemented your algorithm or whatever is that makes up the core of your thesis. Because before you don't have that, if you write prose, there's a high risk that you will have to throw half of your prose away because the result turned different, out differently than expected. And yes, I would spend at least two months on writing prose. Not full time, because most people can't stand to write two months full time. And what worked well for me was kind of do the, um, the core part in the four, first four months, then write, spend the, your productive time of each day on writing, and spend the rest of the time on the bonus studies. Maybe analyze another system or some other question so that you have more variety and create a bigger result without too much risk. Yeah, I totally understand uh, why you say you don't should um, write down your, your pros um, or your results in the beginning. Uh, you basically don't have results. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you start with the introduction, the related work in the first two or three months? You can. There's no single correct way to, to write the thesis. There's different correct ways. So if you want to get some text written before, there's probably no hard reason why you shouldn't. But um, often, if you do it at a later point, it's easier to make it more focused. Because you already know what your result is and what your approach is. And then when you write down the related work, you can focus on how your approach differs from the existing work. If you write the related work at the very beginning, you have to do a much broader scope because you don't know how yours differs from that. And you end up producing twice as much text as you would have later on. It's not bad, though, to write the introduction at first. You get a clearer understanding of your story, but prepare to rewrite it later on. For my PhD thesis, I had to write it four times, completely, completely from scratch, because my colleague told me the first three times that he's not convinced by my introduction. And he was right. But for a master thesis, it typically just takes one or two attempts to write a good introduction. Is it possible that rescoping changes the whole topic? I've, I have never rescoped so much that it changes the entire topic. And I think if you change the topic, you probably need to do some official thing. The topic is just some words, and um, they can also be changed, and it depends on uh, who can judge if this really changes the whole topic. So the official stuff is, I think, not, uh, not so important, but also I did never uh, encounter that scoping really changed the topic completely. Implementation only. By implementation only, I mean that you get a, a task which is only to implement something without a research question, without a scientific background. 
Good question. How many pages should a master thesis be? There's no general answer. A thesis that contains a proof might be very short. A thesis that is a literature survey might be very long because it needs to cover a lot of the content. Uh, depends on the topic, depends on the supervisor, and it depends on the font size and, and line spacing and so on. Pardon? What I got graded on? Typically, there's a, most groups and ours uh, have a, a schema with, I think, eight points, like how hard is the problem, how good is the solution approach, how's the presentation, and so on, with different weights of the topics. And I think the best thing is to ask your supervisor when you start how he's going to grade the thesis. Because, again, there's no generally applicable approach. Internal. The external supervisor doesn't really have a say on the grade. Typically, the internal supervisor will, will ask the external for his opinion, but the, uh, if there's a, not a... It's probably best to ask both, but the more important opinion is of the internal. Okay, last part, presentation. One, one more question. also a good question, how much time should you spend on related work? And again, there's no generally applicable answer. There's some topics which pretty much don't have any related work because it's the first approach in that area. And there's other topics which are pretty much only based on related work because it's, uh, they are rit literature survey-like or heavy topics. So again, it depends on the topic, ask a supervisor, but uh, it's not very helpful advice for you. It's probably what is more applicable, I would do it in iterations. Do a first scan of the literature, then read some stuff, and then after a week or so, decide uh, how much more you need to read and then iterate and then uh, speak with your supervisor how much you've found and how much more you might need to, to look for. So install a tripwire after a certain time that you don't continue to read and read and read and get lost in the related way. Presentation. Um, the more you know about a topic, the harder it is present to, to present to somebody who doesn't know the topic. And the, the bad thing is that you don't feel that. And the master thesis is probably going to be the first time we are really deeply immersed into a topic. And after six months of spending most, most uh, of your time on that topic, it's very hard to, to imagine how somebody feels who does not know the topic. And for, um, from my experience, if you start doing your presentation by opening PowerPoint or some other slideware, this does not work out well. Because you then you will think on, on the tidy problems and you, then you will mostly think of the special stuff in your thesis. And you will probably end up with something which is not easily understandable to an audience. So what from my experience works much better is to start not with a computer, but with post-its. And to first structure the general story of your presentation before you work with slideware. What do I mean by that? When I did this presentation, I took post-its and a, a whiteboard marker and brainstormed all the ideas I had for the presentation and clustered them a bit. And then I created message post-its for the important parts for the important statements I wanted to make, then I ordered them for maximum impact, and then I created slide dummies for the individual slides, for the individual points I wanted to make. And only after I'm finished with that do I create the slides uh, for my final presentation. And I've used that. This is the, the final slide deck for this presentation. And I have the, the dustbin here. Because many of the slides I come up with, or many of the ideas I come up with, I later on notice they are not good. And if I've spent 10 seconds with a whiteboard marker on a post-it, it's no problem to throw it away. But if I've wasted four hours on a single slide in PowerPoint to get some diagram in there, 
even if I later on notice I probably don't need that in my presentation, I'm likely to leave it in there because I spent so much time on it. And I've used that process a lot for many of the presentations I've given in the recent years. And I'm very happy with that. I've taken it from a book, which I have on a later slide. And I can highly recommend that. And I have that also on the thesis guide in a much more detailed post, which gives more details on the individual steps. However, even though you started with the post-its, you still don't know how well your presentation will work. And I've literally listened to several hundred thesis presentations in the last years. And I've made a habit of asking the, the presenters whether they rehearsed the presentation. And some of the good presentations did rehearse, some of the good presentations did not rehearse. But all of the bad presentations did not rehearse, without exception. And I recommend two steps of rehearsal. The first one is alone. Get a key to one of the rooms here where you're going to do your presentation, connect your laptop to the projector, and click through the slides, and give the presentation as if there was an audience. Give it to a virtual audience. You will notice technical problems, you will notice how the room feels, and you will notice when you, when you stumble on slides. You will notice, oh, I don't know what to say at that slide, or I don't know how to make a transition between that slide and the next slide. Or you notice if you, if you go between slides to and fro, that you probably need to change the order. All those things you can find out without having an audience. Also, you, if you use a projector when doing the, the test presentation, you can use the presentation mode, which is not available if you don't have a second monitor. And on the presentation mode, this is a screenshot of what I'm typically seeing. You see what the audience sees, you see the last slide, you see the current slide, and you also see that this slide has an animation because here's something which is not visible here. And you see the next slide and some notes you made. And for me, as a presenter, this is very helpful because every now and then I can look here, what is the next slide, what is the transition I wanted to make, what are the comments. And this does not work if you don't rehearse that. And I suggest you buy something like this, like a clicker. It constrains you less when you walk up and down. The second rehearsal is with a test audience. And I suggest a test audience size of two or three. If you have only one person, then you don't know if that's his personal opinion or if it's a real problem in your presentation. If you have more than three, you don't really get more useful feedback, but the presentation will take much longer because everybody wants to be heard. And uh, use people who are honest and brutal with their feedback. You want to have the problems on the plate in your presentation now and not when you give the final presentation. And after you did those rehearsals, maybe you uh, ask your supervisor if you can do a test presentation with him. I do rehearsals with my students and they don't count for the mark. Only the final presentation counts for the mark of the thesis. I have also have a, uh, an article on how to re rehearse a thesis, uh, the process we use for PhD presentations and thesis presentations on the blog. Last slide, after you hand in Celebrate, this is probably nothing you need to be told. Um, personally, I recommend that you do the, the celebration after handing in. Why do I recommend that? Pers I myself celebrated the evening before I handed in because I had the final document. And on the morning of the day I had to hand in, I was so tired that I was unable to hand in myself. So my flatmate uh, handed in my thesis, and then when the official, when in the Prüfungsamt they asked him why I couldn't hand in myself, he improvised, and then my supervisor called me half an hour later then he, that he heard that I had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> and he was very, Ooh, what, what's wrong with me? But I was just badly hung over. So uh, celebrate the day afterwards, and if something like that happens, be open with your supervisor. It's not, you don't need to be personally present if you hand in the thesis, and it's better if your supervisor knows he's, you're hung over than, than when he thinks you have a nervous breakdown. Three books I recommend. First one is How to Write a Lot. It's on how to produce prose without having too much hassle. 
I read like 10 books on writing during my PhD thesis, and this is the one with the best, by far the best cost-benefit ratio. The second one does have, has nothing to do with thesis, but it's still very useful. It's from David Allen, Getting Things Done. Anybody knows this, this book? Very good. It's like a personal operating system on how to pre prioritize tasks. I still use that. And the third one is uh, Persuasive Presentations from Nancy Duarte. It's the book I have the posted presentation process from. She actually has written the book twice. Once it's called uh, Persuasive Presentations, and once it's called Resonate. And Persuasive Presentations has text. Resonate has mostly pictures, same content. You can read either one, but one, one is sufficient. Before we stop, I would ask you to give me feedback. Vivia has some feedback sheets. Unfortunately, I forgot to translate them. So I'm just there in German, but the first sentence means, was the presentation worth it for you? The second sentence is, what should we keep? And the third sentence is, what should we make differently when we give the presentation next time? My summary is that the technical university provides the platform, but it's your responsibility to create your own environment to do a successful thesis. Thanks for the attention. Yeah, we have some time left for questions. How do you find topics that they can do in a company? I think there are some, um, some sheets on the walls outside. Further questions? Do you need to have to turn your grades in before you register the thesis? No. No, you just have, if you have a supervisor, uh, there's a, just a form you fill out which you sign and the professor signs. The supervisor doesn't even need to sign, and there's nothing else. There's no minimum grade you need to, have a, to, to write a thesis. Very good. No, the thesis does not need to be the last activity. You can, I think, in principle, you could start, start your master studies with a thesis. Many do it as a Except last. Except you have bridging courses. If you have bridging courses, you have to pass them before, but then you could. Um, usually it's not recommended. I mean, in, in the end, the master thesis should, you should prove with your master thesis uh, which kind of knowledge you gained during your studies. So usually you pack up everything that you learned and try to apply it in your thesis. But there is no minimum credit requirement, and sometimes you there is still one exam left or something, it's no problem. Most students do it at the end though. Yeah, very good question. Uh, how technical should your presentation be? Um, the, the biggest problem I see in presentations is that the problem statement is too poorly motivated. Because as a student, I thought, wow, that's the professor, he knows everything, and I'm just going to use all the 20 minutes I have on the solution. And that's not a good idea. Because the professor has very many things to do and is probably not as deep in your topic as you are, and from the 20 minutes you have for the presentation, I recommend to use five to motivate the problem while you work on that problem. And then don't try to force everything you have done into that uh, thesis. And also, 
Typically, it's not a good idea to do a chronological presentation of what you did when. But do it in a way that it's easy to understand. What is the problem? What is the solution? What worked? What did not work so well? What does uh, future work? Further questions? Here's one more. Can you give a Creative Commons license to your thesis? I guess so. Maybe there's some constraints with uh, companies or something, but in principle, I don't think there's anything against that. But I'm not an expert on, on licenses. Pardon? Oh. The first one is the English version, the second one is the German version. Ah. It's the same website, just English and German. So thanks, thanks for your time. One, I forgot one last thing. If you make experiences during a thesis you want to share, drop me a mail, then I can take that on the blog or in the next presentation. Thanks. <laughs>